Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travellers Podcast. Footy fans, footy travelers, hello, and welcome to this episode of the Footy Travelers Podcast. You know, I really want to nail down a unifying name for our listeners. You know, I think it's out there. I think it'll just, uh, it'll find us. Listeners, if you want a say in just how cheesy Mike and I get in greeting you during these intros, head over to our Instagram page and leave a comment on our post about names. We're still taking suggestions, or maybe you think we're just trying too hard. If that's the case, let us know too. In the meantime, I am he whom they call Colin Martin, and I am once again joined by the wonderful Mike Tyrone. And Mike, this episode's a bit of a treat for you, huh? Yes. I'm feeling like this might be the best part of my week right now, talking about this. Now, not that some of our listeners don't already know this about you, but one of your allegiances was revealed in our last episode. For those listening, Mike's wearing a Chelsea jersey right now. (laughs) Finding me in a soccer jersey is definitely not surprising. Uh, And the odds are it will most likely be a Chelsea jersey at that. Chelsea, of course, have been in the news quite a bit recently in a couple different contexts. The more ongoing issue, of course, being the scandal of their soon-to-be former owner, Roman Abramovich, and his ties to the Russian oligarchy, and how sanctions against him and his assets have affected the club. As of this recording, I think we're down to the last three bidders to take over that ownership, a short list that includes LA-based sports billionaire Todd Bowley, and a consortium that now involves sports icons Serena Williams and Lewis Hamilton. Whoever presents that winning bid, though, hopefully will salvage Chelsea from the threat of administration and an otherwise dark period in their history. Yeah, I don't know if I would be able to even articulate those details without being a little bit emotional. But um, more recently, the news has been around the men's first team in more of a positive light, though, uh, having just won the FA Cup semifinal tie against their London rival in Crystal Palace, um, which puts them into the final with another familiar foe in Liverpool. This also gives Chelsea the opportunity to redeem themselves for a trophy against Liverpool, whom if you didn't see it earlier this season, lost in the Carabao Cup final when it went to penalties and it went to 10-10 in penalties and it finally came down to the keepers shooting on each other and our backup goalie and we'll say our PK saving specialist, Kepa Arisa Balaga, launched one into row Z to seal the cup for Liverpool. It was a very disappointing day. And if you can't tell from my tone, It's been a volatile last 16 months to be a Chelsea fan. It's highs and it's lows. Would you would you really call Keppa a PK saving specialist? (laughs) Nonetheless, nonetheless, in this episode, we're focusing on what it's like to be a Chelsea fan in America. Or should I say a Chelsea in America member? You could say either. In this episode, we're going to hear a wonderful conversation Colin and I had with a good friend of mine, a fellow Chelsea supporter member of the Chelsea in America group, and the chapter head of Charm City Blue Supporters Club out of Baltimore, Phil Williams. Like us here on the Footy Travelers podcast, Phil is not only a footy fan, but has shared experiences in teaching, living abroad, and working closely with the young adult and childhood cancer community. He's a lover of world cuisine, especially Georgian food, which is yet another thing we share in common. And he keeps his mind sharp by exploring the arts, engaging in his own creative pursuits through retrowave and modern takes of 80s culture, and disconnecting every once in a while with some hiking and bike riding. As Mike and I talk to Phil about all things Chelsea FC, I will add that I personally enjoyed how long it took all of us to realize that Phil and I had actually met before. <laughs> Along the way to that realization, we explore Phil's experience as a Chelsea fan in the 90s, his feelings on being called a plastic, and of course, his thoughts on the club's current ownership saga. You know, it kind of had this period of doubt in my head, like, am I going to have a club to support come August? 
like, are we going to have money to end the season, you know, and complete it? One last bit of added context. We recorded this conversation with Phil remotely while we were in Orlando for the USA Panama World Cup qualifier match the day after that game. So you'll hear a reference to a very specific and special moment in that game towards the end of this episode. We sent a kid named Mason to the game last night. And Mason was the first kid that we sent last night in a couple years. And Saturday at the practice, he met Christian Pulisic. This also means we won't be discussing Phil's very recent trip to Wembley to see Chelsea take on Crystal Palace in that aforementioned FA Cup semifinal on Easter Sunday. Well, Mike... Are you excited? I'm excited, but even more so, I am carefree wherever we may be because we are the famous CFC. All right. Well, let's uh, listen in and hear what you're so excited about. I'm excited to have a good friend and fellow diehard Chelsea fan on the pod. It only took so long for Colin to accept and finally let my fandom creep into the episodes. But nonetheless, I have standards. I have standards. (laughs) Fair. That's fair. Low standards. But nonetheless, (laughs) this man that we have here with us uh, is a blue through and through. A guy I've shared many laughs, hugs, cries, bounces, Jameson shots and constant club chants with Mr. Phil Williams. Phil, welcome to the Footy Travelers podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. Good to be here and uh, hanging out with you two guys tonight. I believe this is the first time that you have met Colin, uh, even though there have been several instances where I've tried to have you two meet in person. We had our plan for Euro 2020 in Europe, then that yeah. moved over to the hope of watching the Euro 2020 final in 2021 in Baltimore at our favorite watering hole in Salancha. That also didn't happen. But uh, here's our first <laughs> virtual introduction, uh, in-person meeting, sure to follow. Phil, great to meet you, man. Been uh, hearing a lot about you, especially recently as Chelsea is doing well in the Prem. But uh, yeah, good to see you. And hopefully that in-person meeting comes soon. Pleasure to meet you as well, Colin. Uh, yeah, I hope so as well. It'd be nice to talk shop over a couple pints in person. I'm bored of talking with Mike all the time, so it's nice to have new... I'm just joking, Mike. But it's good to have new faces. <laughs> hey, it gets old sometimes, doesn't it, huh? He's sick of me. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Vice versa. <laughs> we get sick of each other from time to time, but we love each other. Yeah. Well, Phil, I, uh, I just want to jump right into it and um and ask you straight up you know you live in america from what i hear why why chelsea <laughs> all right why chelsea so i'll try to keep this short because as mike knows i can be very long-winded but uh like most other americans of my generation i fell in love with the world cup in world cup 94 um specifically the netherlands team from not watching soccer i just was drawn to the orange shirts and Good play. A lot of guys had dreadlocks on the team. I thought it was really cool. And then from there, I didn't really watch a lot of soccer after that, but I took a liking to Ajax. Um, They became my team. And then in the mid-90s, maybe 96 or 97, ESPN2 randomly started showing Premier League on Monday nights, and I started watching a few games here and there. And I I was immediately – I was drawn to Arsenal and Aston Villa and Newcastle at first, but then Chelsea comes along and – I don't know. I think Chelsea lost the first couple of games I watched, but I knew they had Coors as a shirt sponsor and a couple of guys I recognized from uh, World Cup 94. And then uh, I watched the 97 FA Cup final on pay-per-view. Chelsea Chelsea won 2-0 and Roberto Di Matteo scored 16 seconds into the game. And uh, that's uh, the moment I said, this is my team. And then I uh, moved to Japan the year after in 98 and was part watched a lot of the Cup Winners Cup uh, run when we beat Stuttgart in the final. And then it just kind of kind of grew from there. And then it was growing and growing. And then I'll never forget this. In the 2000, we were in Champions League, played Barcelona in the round of 16. Uh, 1-3-1 in London, and this is Barcelona with like Figo, Rivaldo, I mean, pretty much like every prominent Dutch guy. Kluivert was one of my favorite players growing up. And I woke up I woke up at 3 in the morning in Singapore to watch the game in a hotel, me and my father. 
screaming like a madman at three in the morning. And then two or three weeks later, go back to Barcelona, lose 5-1. I have to go to school after the game, and I have my first ever Chelsea jersey. I still have it here. I went to the bus stop crying because we got pounded 5-1. <laughs> and it hurt. Uh, it hurt from afar. Oh, it sucked. And uh, again, another game I woke up at four in the morning, and then my friend was like, you must really love Chelsea. And I was like, yeah, I do love Chelsea. And then it's just blown up from there. So I love that. I love the backstory. And I feel like when we first met, you gave me a good part of that backstory. But I, there's a lot of a lot in there that I've learned just even from that response. So I, I think the, yeah. the cliff notes are always evolving, which is always great with you. So you are a big sports fan. As we sit here, you have a hockey stick behind you. So why is soccer your most loved sport? Or is it? Uh, great question. Um, it is. It definitely is. Most people that know me know me as Chelsea Phil. So I think that's uh, well and true. Yeah, I do love hockey as well. That I started playing soccer at age five and it just stuck with me. It's something I just kept playing and playing. And then, um, you know, also growing up, in Ellicott City, Columbia area, where, you know, youth soccer is very big in that area. That also kind of just drove it home. I played a lot of sports as a kid. Like, I did baseball, I did basketball. But soccer was always, like, I always got excited about soccer. You mentioned um, being a fan of Chelsea, but also Ajax uh, as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Ever been called a plastic? Oh, many times. <laughs> Especially since 2004. <laughs> What are your th what are but, what were your um, thoughts or reactions when you when you heard that or or recalled that? Oh uh, yeah, it, it was a little annoying at first. Just very annoying. Like I don't know, I don't know if it was annoying is the right word, but it was just really weird that um, a lot of Americans started liking Chelsea in the two thousands. Like people would recognize my jersey whenever I would walk out, and I'm like, oh, how do you know Chelsea? Like what's what's going on? But yeah, I didn't like it at first, but now I mean, I just, I tell people like, oh yeah, I was a fan since 97 and uh and i can spout out like mike knows i have almost a near encyclopedic memory of uh chelsea since then so people realize real quick i'm not plastic i'm, I'm definitely uh very much part of my dna so so i think a lot of people believe that all chelsea fans are plastic because of the new age the new money the new success but how would yeah. you today personally describe the Chelsea fan base? Mm. Very varied, very diverse. I started when Chelsea was not well known, but it was right when we started winning titles. The first year I saw was it FA Cup, Cup, UEFA Cup Winners Cup. We won UEFA Super Cup, beat Real Madrid, never challenging for Premier League. And now, I mean, it's like a massive global fan base. I mean, Chelsea in America has 31 chapters alone. There's other chapters that are not affiliated with Chelsea in America all across the U.S. I mean, there's Chelsea in Montreal. I met people from Chelsea, Toronto, like six years ago. Didn't know there was Toronto. Like we're we're at we're all over the globe now. So you know, it's it's kind of like um, uh, I guess the best way to describe our fans now is um, we're like not as obnoxious as Man United fans because they just talk about twenty times all the time and it's really annoying. I mean, they're like they're like Duke and we're like North Carolina now. So. It's a good analogy. It's a good analogy. I guess that's the best way we can describe it. Yeah, I think it's the best way I can describe it, honestly. And then, you know, also, I mean, just it's easy to fly to London, easier to fly to London than like anywhere else in the UK. Like anybody, anywhere you go in the UK, most of the time you got to fly through London. And so speaking of flying to London and you being a fan for a little longer or beginning a little earlier than that 2004 era, yeah. have you ever been to Stamford Bridge? And how did you feel about being there? As someone who, you know, I'm presuming had watched from afar for so long. Oh, man, this is like my greatest shame. So I, I've never been for a game. I've gone over twice and both times I've had games rescheduled. Actually, so I've only I've only walked around the outside. I've seen Chelsea every time they've come to the U.S. since 2004. That's about it. Uh, I'm kind of hoping, I got my fingers crossed, I'll get a ticket for the semifinal in Wembley on April 17th um, because I'm off that week. So I'm hoping that's my first experience seeing them live in the UK. But no, I haven't I haven't been yet. And it's kind of sad because, you know, 25, I'm 25 years next month, or May rather, that I'm supporting Chelsea and not going uh, really just, it's, it's kind of lame. So I, I need to change that. I, I I actually I always assumed that you had and and I, I know that shame though as well because I've been a fan for so long and 
it was only until 2020, right before the pandemic, when I was able to get to Stanford Bridge for the first time. I had two matches canceled yeah. on two trips that I was there too. So I do think, you know, I think um, when you meet people from the UK and they're like, oh, you're a fan of a club in our country. So that means you must have been to a match there. That's like the full sign of like street cred kind of thing. And they find out you haven't, which is, is tough because, you know, getting a ticket to these matches is not easy, especially from coming from the States. Like you have to truly be like very dedicated and do a lot of logistics. And so I do think it's almost unfair to some fan bases to consider like your most diehard fans are ones that haven't actually stepped on the grounds because they can still be incredibly big fans just from, you know, watching and supporting on television and, and other mediums. And, and I'll also say it's, it's a little harder to get tickets for us because our stadium is significantly smaller than, you know, Arsenal, Spurs, United. I, our stadium's smaller than Aston Villa as far as capacity goes. Yeah. By like 6,000 fans. Yeah. And considering again, the London thing and, our stature rising over the last 20 years and with all the fan clubs popping up everywhere. I mean, it's, it's a little more difficult now. So I think that's a great segue into, you know, one of the reasons that you and I had met was through the charm city blues, which is a chapter of Chelsea and America fan group. And yeah. so I think getting access to tickets is one of the many perks or easier ticket access uh, is one of the many perks of being a, a member of the Chelsea in America group. But any other things that you would say um, are great benefits to joining a fan base, whether it's Chelsea in America or just any of your clubs that you may support that have fan groups in based in America? Absolutely. It's definitely beneficial to be part of them. Now, Chelsea in America is not officially recognized. It's like a coalition, but our club piv pivoted a couple of years ago where every supporters group around the world that has more than 20 people is now like an official supporters group. So that's also actually has eased the process, I think, a little bit. But it's definitely, for Chelsea supporters, it's definitely better to go through Chelsea in America. It's going to be a lot easier for you to get tickets, um, even for away matches. But definitely for home matches, it's a lot easier. You get access to the tour. You're going to find out about the summer tour more before everyone else, which hopefully we will be back this summer. That's the plan right now is to come in July. Not officially announced because of um, obvious reasons. I'm sure we'll touch into that later. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's definitely good. And then you, you also like find out like oh, there's meet and greets happening or, you know, in, in some cases, like with some of the other teams, like players or recently retired players have gone to their pub and hung out for a couple hours and you wouldn't find that out without without joining the clubs like you know i hate saying this word but tottenham came and they had a couple players go to their bar patrick vieira came to our bar one time on a, at night but it wasn't for like summer tour with arsenal but he just popped in randomly and there just happened to be like a couple arsenal guys there so it was a big thrill for them as a member of uh, the Chelsea in America group, I think even just the exposure to the news uh, of the club and other, you know, really important aspects of just being a fan. And one of the things that we'll probably touch upon in, in a, a little bit later about, you know, what's going on with Chelsea right now, as, as people are probably very <laughs> sure of, they know all that's going on. Salacious lead in Mike, salacious. <laughs> But I think there is <laughs> there is a, a lot of benefit to just having access and hearing a lot um, from the club sort of indirectly through the fan bases um, rather than just sort of, yeah. you know, being an attendee at one of the signature bars. Hey, everyone. We hope you're loving the show. If you are, we'd love it. If you showed us your love, here's a couple simple ways to do that. Be sure to hit subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to this episode. Even better, send this episode to a friend and tell them to listen as well. If you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, we'd love it if you'd leave us a star rating and write a review for us. It's a great way to help others discover our show. Finally, engage with us on Instagram. Follow, like, tag, or DM the Footy Travelers handle at Footy Travelers. As always, 
If you want more info on anything you hear about in our episodes, check out the show notes or reach out to us through the contact page on FiperMedia.com. All right, back to the show. Well, let's 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 ride this um, this momentum here and bring up that that salacious topic Mike alluded to earlier. Phil, I think even you mentioned the the summer tour that probably won't happen this year for a particular reason. As a non Chelsea fan, I have some questions that have just been on my mind about this whole situation for a while, and I want definitely want to get your perspective. All right, and this is great for me and you, Phil, because mm-hmm. we haven't really met each other yet. So, a lot of our listeners, I assume, have heard about. Roman Abramovich, the owner of the Chelsea Football Club, his ties to the Russian oligarchy. Just tell me, you know, Phil, what are your general thoughts and feelings on him as a person? Let's just start there. All right. So Roman Abramovich, um, obviously, my view of him is going to be more positive than negative. Good to be self-aware. He, well, I mean, first of all, he rescued us from a very perilous situation. Um this is not an unprecedented time for Chelsea. I think the year I was born in 1982, we were sold for one pound to the previous owner. And then right along the time that I came along as a supporter, we were racking up debt like crazy, spend, 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 well, mostly on wages. And then um, that summer that Abramovich came in, we were 30 million in debt. And 30 million in 2003 was big and I specifically remember the last game of that season in 0203. We just happened to play Liverpool in the last game, and it just so happened that whoever won the game won the Champions League or made the Champions League. And we fortunately won and pretty much saved the club. Otherwise, we were going to do a Leeds. And then Abramovich came in that year and saved us from a very, very bad situation. And then, you know, all the money pumping came in, and we were winning, and we all loved them. And I think from a football aspect, more good than bad. He led us to just just watching us winning a league was like the most surreal thing ever. And that, that was only seven years in for me. And I, I I still remember everything about that day. But then, you know, the, also the bad thing is like, you know, rifling through managers, constant payouts, having to restructure the way the clubs run after FFP came in. But I think he's definitely very passionate about the club. It's weird to say that about a guy who owned our team for 19 years, and I've never heard his voice ever. I don't think he's ever given an interview. I think one print interview, but never done an in-person interview. So he's always had this air of mystique or a bit of unknown about him because no one knows what he sounds like other than the people that work there. But um, yeah, you know, the bill started to come off in 2018 with, uh, there was a spy poisoned and he hasn't been in the UK since then or hasn't lived there. And, you know, you kind of sort of realize, you know, or it was a, a bit of a real world reminder that sometimes ugly arcs, well, most of the time they're going to be connected to people higher up in, in Russian politics. And, you know, I think people understood that and those links have always been there. I think we've just ignored it because of the success. It's, it's genuinely seemed like he's tried to distance himself from Putin since then. I mean, I don't know. And it's just what it seemed from my perspective. And, you know, he's he's done a lot of good for Chelsea um, as well. I mean, single-handedly spearheading the campaign to end, the, to end anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic chants at Stamford Bridge, most notably against one particular club. Like, he's been the forefront of that. He is Jewish, after all. And uh, he also recently got Israeli citizenship, I think, in 2019. So he's led a lot of good campaigns like that and letting the NHS workers stay at the Chelsea Hotel at Stamford Bridge for free at the onset of the pandemic. And he's also done a lot of good work to advance, you know, the lives of Jewish people around the globe. But the situation now, it's like maybe he's been trying to distance himself from the connections, but the connections are still there. He owned the company that supplied steel for Russian tanks. Uh, that's been known for a long time, but it's becoming more prominent now. So, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. I can, I have more good opinions of him. I think not just from a footballing perspective, but as a person. But again, he's very mysterious. I, I, I know almost anything that happens with Chelsea. I, that's the, one of the first things I read about every morning and I've never heard the guy talk. So you don't know what's happening in the shadows, really. It's crazy. I, I'm the same we'll way. We'll see what happens. There's this like, there's this huge mystique about him 
And I think the fan base has, has been able to grow so substantially under his ownership. And you see it in a lot of football clubs now when the new money comes in and they just are able to make an immediate impact. And I think that's where you win fans over, right? Like winning fans over is by winning matches, winning trophies. And they sometimes right. will forget about how that money is made. And, mm -hmm. and I think now, because the world is just highlighting a lot of the issues that are swirling around the sport itself and asking more questions about ownership and affiliations. I think Chelsea fans specifically are maybe having some doubts over, you know, their fandom, their allegiance. Mm -hmm. How do you feel all of this kind of constantly evolving, changing uh, story that's happening around the club has impacted your allegiance and, and and then also the the fans themselves. How do you think it's it's impacting them and and the players? I think I I don't know how the players feel. I I can imagine what's happening with them now. I mean, up until last week, we don't we didn't know if they were going to get paid in April. And same with the backroom staff. Like you'd never hear about like the people who like wash their jerseys at training every day. You didn't know if they were going to get paid. I mean, they're impacted too. Um. I don't think any fans have changed their allegiance. I think if anything, I mean, for the diehards, it's strengthened the allegiance of Chelsea even more. I would say especially amongst UK-based fans, just from what I've combed through incessantly on Twitter. For me, it was a, it was a week of, I don't want to say I was questioning my allegiance. It was more like, you know, what the heck's going to happen? You know, I think not just, I, I we knew the sanctions were coming. I think it was like a real kick in the teeth that, that he got sanctioned on their 117th birthday. And that, that really, that really was a, that was a tough blow. You know, it kind of had this period of doubt in my head, like, am I going to have a club to support come August? Like, are we going to have money to end the season, you know, and complete it? And then if we run out of money, like, and we complete the season, are we in administration? Are we starting with negative points next year? But you know, you, your mind kind of creeps and you think about like, you know, what happens, like, how does my life change if there's no Chelsea in August? And this is not just like a team for me, like they've been a prominent part of my life for 25 years, especially in the early years when you know, I was, I moved back and forth twice over the Pacific Ocean and I was used to friends coming and going and life changing every 18 months and then um Chelsea was like always the constant. So it was like, how, what would that void look like? You know, I kind of thought myself like if they went under, like I would probably lose my passion for soccer for a little while, you know, not probably not watch it for a couple of years because I would just be too hurt. I definitely wouldn't watch English soccer ever again. But I think, um, I think in the end, you know, I, my allegiance is never been stronger. I'm never going to quit Chelsea no matter what. Like if we died it and the fans formed the feeder club, I had said to myself, I was going to support that team. I feel most people who are above a casual fan are very much strengthened. And then the casuals are just kind of mixed. I don't think like anybody, I don't, I haven't seen anybody say like, I'm going to go support another team or whatever. I think, you know, people understand big money is often comes through dirty means. So I don't know. It's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch throughout definitely the next five to 10 years of the sport. Probably something that you're going to see maybe some Newcastle fans uh, wrangling with as well, outside of the UK anyway, because their, their ownership group is connected to, I mean, just a really nasty like dictator. Some stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is crazy. Football's always been a bit political, but it's usually been amongst the ultras. But now, especially with this Chelsea thing, we've crossed a threshold that's never going to go back ever again where – sports and geopolitics are now intertwined and it's just something that we're going to live with throughout every sport it'll be an interesting to see how that how everything is impacted by that well i can't think of a better maybe segue to my next question you know you mentioned as you called it this chelsea thing mm -hmm. the next five to ten years and you know you have uh it sounds like some creative pursuits and passion so let me uh offer you an opportunity to exercise that a little bit <laughs> this story got a little more interesting this week. Um, I think it was reported that Roman Abramovich and the Ukrainian peacekeepers or Roman Abramovich was negotiating uh, hopefully some peace with uh, Ukraine. Yeah. And they suspect that they were all poisoned. Yeah. So 
honestly, who knows where this will all end, how it'll end. But go ahead and, and just write me the ending of this saga off the cuff. It can be as fantastical or, you know, a most likely scenario as you want. But how would you say this is all going to end? Okay. All right. So to Roman Abramovich, I think at a certain point, I, I, I would like the good ending would be like he helps to negotiate some sort of peace between Ukraine and Russia. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, for him, I know that the Ukrainian president asked Joe Biden not to sanction him. Abramovich does own property in Colorado, but he's heavily involved with the peace process. So if there is peace, I think he will definitely go good on his promise to donate more of his own personal fortune to help rebuild Ukraine. And I think the public perception of him in the Western world will go back to being a favorable one. Now he will never own a club in England ever again, that's for sure. I think he's trying to buy another club right now somewhere else in Europe, but I don't know how that's going to work. Um, as for Chelsea, we're going to have a new owner in the next 30 to 35 days. At this point, I hope it's the guy who who's like in the LA Dodgers. I think he will he'll buy the team. He'll have to sink a billion pounds into the stadium to redevelop it because if we want to stay competitive, yeah, you know, stay competitive with Man City and stay competitive with Liverpool and uh, maybe Arsenal if they ever change their business structure around a little bit and get a little more aggressive with pursuing trophies because I don't think they've been a really well-run club, but they seem to be back now. They backed the manager and they made good signings, so looks like they're proper back. So it's going to be like four teams we have to compete with. And in order to do that, we're going to have to expand the stadium. And that's a very complicated thing to do in our neighborhood. I don't think you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been around there, Colin, but we had no shortage of bidders because of the postcode that we play in. We play in one of the most expensive postcodes in the UK, if not the most expensive. And the property values and all that, it's very complicated to get permits to do the work that we wanted to do for the stadium under Bramovitz. So that'll take some time for the new owner to come in and do. And then after that, it's a question of how much money they have to spend on the on the squad. Uh, it could go like like City and still have a lot of money left over after the stadium. And the stadium cost is being uh, is kind of being built into the price of the club right now, which is why when this is all said and done, this is going to be the most expensive sports transaction in the history of sports. So that cost goes in, and then it's a question of how much they want to spend year after year. The Dodgers guy, I don't know how to say his last name, but he seems to understand what's going to be required. Bo, 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 Bully, maybe? Yeah, probably, Bully. probably Bully. But he seems to be the most grounded one on what it's going to take. Like, be competitive, win. Hopefully, we can get to a point where we don't have to rely on spending $100 million on players all the time. And, I mean, obviously, Mike, you know we spent all that money on Lukaku. But, I mean, the, the amount of effort it took us to get that money in the first place, hopefully, we won't have to do that again. But, I, you know, maybe we'll, we'll probably either stay strong or we'll probably wobble a bit like Arsenal did for a few years and maybe like Spurs. Because funding your own stadium, obviously, is a, it's 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 a heavy toll, especially for the way Arsenal went about it. I mean, that that set them back for many many years. But you know, we could shoot, we could stay where we are, or increase, or probably slowly decrease for a couple of years, and then go back up. I don't think we're gonna completely dive bomb. We're gonna still be up there, and we're still gonna probably be arguably the biggest sporting attraction in London. So I, I'm not too worried about the club per se, as long as Bowley wins, and I'm pretty sure he probably will. But again, it's just gonna depend on how quickly we can get the stadium redeveloped. It's it's hard, and like Abramovich was very ambitious with the previous stadium plan, but we were gonna have to displace people out of their houses. So yeah, it's it's gonna be uh, interesting to see what happens. I think it's kind of interesting, you know, the year that the the club has had a, about a year ago, fans were standing outside of Stamford Bridge chanting, we saved football because we were the first club to step out of the Super League. And then a few mo weeks later, we win the Champions League. And now we are going through administration, essentially, and selling our club due to sanctions. <laughs> it's just it has been the most wild roller coaster of a year that I think any club has probably ever experienced. And one of the, my favorite parts about that story and the whole year itself has been how many funny and great chants there are <laughs> that have come out of it. Um, <laughs> be, because, you know, winning the Champions League, you get some pretty good chance there and saving, mm -hmm. you know, all of professional football, apparently to a lot of Chelsea fans. That's a good uh, chant as well. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I mean, we, we did for the time. We did for the time. But 
the Champions League is changing in a couple years, so it's going to be Super League adjacent. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that they're they're going to like ten group stage games to, and that's extra money. It's it is you know what it's it's um the whole Super League thing is because the one thing that Premier League does better than any other league is market itself to the globe. The television deal that we're getting all this money from and like the prize money, that's mostly from the domestic deal because that's what people wanted to watch. But, you know, La Liga has terrible television sharing rights. Premier League doesn't. It's way better. But La Liga, like 60, 65% of the television money goes to two teams. You know what two teams. <laughs> and no one cares about the French League. I mean, it's, it's rubbish. And Serie A is like, outdated stadiums and people associated with boring football it's great if you love tactics but attention spans are going down now and then um the german league is like it's awesome the german league is awesome it's the best fan culture league but they're all about the in-person fan experience rather than marketing itself as like a global juggernaut and i kind of dig that because you can go to a german game right now and spend like 20 or 30 euro and not spend 50 pounds to watch chelsea thump like five goals past some Muppet team. So, Muppet. you know, the Premier League is, is high on that, but because the Premier League is so high and that domestic television deal alone gives clubs the ability to compete. Like, uh, so I, I always, I like to use this example a lot, but you remember Jordan Shakiri? he plays in MLS now, but he was at Bayern Munich and then he went to Inter Milan and then he went to Stoke. And I'm like, like that's a weird career arc, but Stoke can pay wages similar to what, like Juventus can pay or Everton can pay similar wages to Juventus and they're like almost relegated. And that's like where the super league was born out of. It was Barcelona, Juventus and Real Madrid because they can't do stuff like the Liga won't let them play a game over here in the U S and they shouldn't. But you know, Juventus is like, um, Juventus is like a shark in a pond, but they can't get to bigger waters. And that's like why they're still pushing this thing. And then, so you wait for changing champions league is kind of like a compromise, but Everyone knows, like, a Super League's kind of been on the cards for yeah. the, the last money, decade. And it, the money will win eventually. Yeah, it always will. I mean, you're going to see it in November when they have this World Cup in Qatar. Ugh. I won't get started on that, but yeah. <laughs> that yeah that could be a whole nother conversation but you answered one of the questions we we like to do kind of a rapid fire question uh to sort of close out some of our conversation and one of the questions that we were going to ask was rank all of the european leagues and you pretty much already did that for us because i liked your rundown of all of them so i want to drill into one that's uh a little bit more focused focused on england so i want you to rank these clubs by your most disliked so we're gonna go Arsenal, Leeds, Spurs, QPR, Fulham. <laughs> From uh, least hated to most hated or vice versa? However you want. All right. Spurs one through five. <laughs> <laughs> no, I joke, Great I answer. joke, I joke. Okay. Uh, Spurs are one. Leeds are two. Arsenal three, narrowly. QPR four. And five, like I don't even want to put Fulham in this. Like, I get, don't. I don't hate Fulham. I had know, a feeling. So I had a feeling. I had to throw them in there. I had to throw them in there as sort of like this weird outlier because yeah. I knew it was more like territorial grounds. It wasn't really like much hatred. <laughs> They're not a threat. Yeah, it's the it's the best it's the best away trip. It's the best away trip. You just got to go a mile further. Yeah, exactly. I don't hate Fulham. I, I'm I'm like apathetic to them. I heard some of their fans are apathetic as well. <laughs> uh, Let me bring one to you um, from the Chelsea perspective. You're a USA guy. CP10 is a member of your your favorite club. If Christian Pulisic wanted to transfer, which team would you be okay with him going to, and which team would you uh, would it break your heart if he went there? I'm gonna try and not answer Spurs for this. I have to be <laughs> okay. Uh, it would suck if he went to Liverpool. And then what team I would love for him to go to? Or which one would hurt the least? Any team outside of England really would be great. But I would love to watch him go play in Spain. Not even for like Barcelona or Real Madrid, but like Christian Pulisic playing for like Sevilla would be really awesome for me to watch him play there. So that would probably be my first choice. Just because that, that, I feel like that's a club that would like, he would, he would go to tomorrow and like fit in really well with and be a starter. He wouldn't get tackled as much or injured as much in Spain. 
And I think that style of play there would suit him really well. Plus, he's already done England and Germany. And then, like, him going to France would just be so boring. Yeah. And then... Um, I agree. And then, you know, Italy, yeah, maybe... It, him going to Italy would be all right, but I'd, I'd rather see him in Spain. And like, plus like Sevilla is like the the city in Spain. I would, I really would love to go see a game. I don't care about the Bernabeu or Camp Nou. Like Seville's like a city I would love to go to to see a game. So I, I would love for him to go to Sevilla. Christian, if you're listening, your fans would wholly support you moving to La Liga. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no. Okay. Next, next you question. Gotta win a league with Chelsea first. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Next question. Captain JT, John Terry, or Captain Dave Cesar Espilicueta? Oh, I got to go with John Terry. Espilicueta is a legend. I think uh, up until a year ago where he's starting to slowly decline. I mean, that's one of the best signings we ever made, Espilicueta. But JT being the first guy from the academy in my fandom to come up, you know, played there almost his whole career and gave us heart and soul in every tackle. I mean, on, on the field. What a legend. <laughs> King is born. But on the field. Phil, I don't know if you saw me throw my arms up when you mentioned Arsenal earlier, but I'm a Gunners fan, full disclosure. Probably should have said that at the top of things. Yeah. But, you know, better better late than never. I, I figured that out pretty quick. Sling me sling me your best <laughs> insult. About Arsenal? Ooh. <laughs> oh, this is, I mean, where do I go with this? There's so many insults I could say. But I would say... Uh, I mean, all my insults now are for Spurs, but I say, I would say the best, the most exciting thing about Arsenal the last 10 years has been Arsenal fan TV. Like, not even anything connected with your club. Like, no one gives a crap about Arsenal on the field. Everybody wanted you, the whole football world wanted you to lose because, you know, we get a better episode of Arsenal fan TV <laughs> when it happened. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that alone right there. To be fair, the company is called Cronky Sports Entertainment. So as long as you're being entertained, oh, yeah. Stan is happy. That is, yeah. Got that Walmart money going on the end. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. All right. Next question. Back back to the Blues. Yes. 2012 Champions League win or 2021 Champions League win? <laughs> 2012. 2012. Solely because... Beating Bayern in their stadium was the greatest thing ever. I laugh at some of the Bayern people crying outside the pub because their asshole who was running their team at the time for years had slagged off Chelsea and Abramovich incessantly. He always said, he said one time at a Bayern General Assembly, I'm never going to pimp out the club like Chelsea's doing. And then we beat them in their stadium. And then the year after, their guy went to jail for tax evasion for a couple of years. It's brilliant. Suck it, Bayern. I was so great. I still lord it over him every time I get. I always bring him 2012. Schweinsteiger came to MLS, and I was yelling, Donka Schweini, every time he got with a near shot. I showed him a picture of him missing the penalty. Oh, my God. That was the best day of my life. The love definitely sounds real from you. Oh, my God. Oh, I still get oh, goosebumps. So, Phil, one, one of the aspects of this show is, you know, really a, a great excuse for Mike and I to just – travel together and, and meet people who are also uh, lovers of the beautiful game. So a, a few travel oriented questions for you. You are currently in DC. What would you say are the three best things DC has to offer if anyone was traveling to DC? Oh, restaurants, diverse world cuisine. I mean, anything you can think of, especially the Ethiopian food. The Ethiopian food here is amazing. It's great Serbian food, Georgian food, uh, culture, arts, the museums, especially the Smithsonian's because they're free. And there's a lot of stuff you can do in D.C. without spending a, uh, a single dollar, which is also incredible. And green space. It's uh, one of the most greenest cities you could think of. There's so many parks. And with the building height restriction, you can see sunlight pretty much all hours that the sun is up. So those are the three best things about D.C. Culture, restaurants, and green space. Love it. It's a solid answer. I like that. I, I always need, as a Baltimorean, I always need good reasons and explanations for why DC is nice because, you know, we're just the the, the younger brother that gets yeah. made fun of all the time. Did you just call yourself a Baltimorean? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> um, so back to I've DC. I was, I was born there. I would have badge proudly. Yeah, there we go. 
back to DC, name the most <laughs> underrated neighborhood and the most overrated neighborhood. <laughs> All right. Most underrated neighborhood is easy. It's a neighborhood called Mount Pleasant. It feels like you live in a small town. You forget you're in DC until you leave the neighborhood and you go out. Great farmer's market, couple good restaurants, good coffee shop. Most overrated neighborhood, U Street. I think it's just become too much like everywhere else. It's kind of lost its uniqueness. It's very bro-y nowadays. And the only time I pass, it's on the train. But I think U Street's very overrated. There's other cool places to hang out in the city. World Cup, Qatar, 2022. Will we see you there? Am I going? No. <laughs> I have no interest in going to Qatar, that World Cup. Oh, my God. I'm not going to go on a tangent. But I'm still salty that World Cup's not here. That should have been here. and We had the best bid, and everybody knows the story why. But I'm going to wait, and in 2026, I am committing myself to going to a game in Canada, in the U.S., and in Mexico. So I'm going to save up for that. But next on my football calendar is trying to go to Euro 2024 in Germany. And maybe if I can swing Women's World Cup in 2023 in Australia, because I would love to go back to Australia. Great country. We're doing it. The, We're footy, doing the it. footy travelers are going to the Women's World Cup for sure. Uh, Colin and I have been trying oh. to go to uh, all of the continents together, and that is the last of the non-frozen continents that we want to travel together to, or we need to. Yes. And let's be honest, you know, the women's team rocks, and we need to support our women. So. Yes. Absolutely. And I, I'll say I went to Australia in the late 90s for about a week, but I was living in Japan, so a much more manageable flight. But, I mean, the most unique country you will ever, ever go to, and I mean, like, in that in the best way possible, I, Australia is fantastic. Aussies are, like, the coolest people on earth. I, every time I meet an Aussie, like, I, I love them. So it's, it's a great time. I hope I, I – actually, I hope I get to join you guys on that trip, to be honest with you. The invitation um, is so open. I'll try to make that work. But, yeah, that's the best, that's the best country. I have one last question. It's very ran- it's very random, but you brought up Georgian food, and so I have to ask it, and we can close it out as a weird random question. But is kachapuri the best food in the world that is associated with cheese? Oh, the bread bowl? Dude, dude, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sold me on Georgian food, man. That was incredible. Like, the dude came over and mixed the bread, egg, and cheese. Oh, my God. You had me at dude. I didn't want to leave the restaurant. I wanted to get six, but I probably would die at the <laughs> restaurant if I did that. But man, it's oh my god, that's the best. That's like the best one of the best meals I've ever had in my life. Well, we when uh, Colin comes back east, um, wait, I just remembered. You two have met each other at the DC United game at the supporter section. You may not remember it very well, oh. but <laughs> <laughs> wait, which one of us? <laughs> I, I don't know how I just realized and that. Also, and also, it sounds oh. like you forgot too, Mike. So I can't know. Oh, my God. That night. That was three years ago. Oh, my God. We Listen, went out, we went out to eat after? Mm-hmm. Yes. At Dacha. Yes. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Colin, we'll have to get a beer in real life next time, and then I'll have to tell you that story. That's not for the podcast. That's fair. That's that is fair. not Maybe for the, the podcast. Maybe the beer will help us uh, spark our memory. Back. We'll do some. We'll do beer and kachapuri, oh. and uh, and we'll catch up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I uh, I'm so thankful that you accepted the invitation to join us on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And when we think about bringing in people with really cool and unique perspectives, and talking about how football, you know, is a big part of their life, and your perspective mm-hmm. is is something that I value. So thank you so much for taking the time and um, being able to be a good advocate for the sport for, for Chelsea and, and just uh, being a good guy. I appreciate everything. I appreciate you. Thank you. Can I, can I say one last thing real quick? Absolutely. Um, I want to shout out, speaking of Baltimore, a uh, Baltimore based charity named Craig Willinger fund that I'm on the board of Mike knows it, but um, we sent a kid named Mason to the game last night. You know, Mason is like our, our mission is we provide kids with cancer a chance to fulfill their soccer dreams. And it was named for Craig Willinger, who sadly passed away from leukemia about 10 years ago. And one of the last things he did when he was alive was he went over to Germany to, to go see Bayern München. And we kind of kept that spirit on. And Mason was the first kid that we've sent last night in a couple of years. 
So we sent him last night with his family. And Saturday at the practice, he went to see the team train. They gave him a signed jersey. He met Christian Pulisic. And he told Christian Pulisic, if you score, can you please do the worm for me? And he did it last night. And then the men's national team Twitter tweeted it. And it went viral. And it was really crazy. And I, I was just so happy for this kid. I mean, he's such a great kid. And we don't know what the future is going to look like for him as far as will he make a full recovery. But um, it was so great that our organization I- exists and being able, to, being able to send kids to do stuff like this or to go see our women's team or to go to see Chelsea play or AC in the line. I think we've sent a kid to Arsenal as well. But um, I wanted to shout out Quig Willinger fund. Like I've uh, I've helped them. I've, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of the board members and I've known – all of them for a long time, but they only joined the, joined the board three years ago. And this is like the first time that I remember we sending a kid somewhere. So thank you, Christian Pulisic, for making this kid's dream come true. And you, you really don't know how much it meant to him and how much it meant to all of us. So uh, thank you. And a big thank you to USA Soccer for taking care of Mason this weekend in Orlando. And uh, I was glad to see the team put on a good show for everybody. So yeah, we were we were at the game and we saw the worm and um, we saw the the social media viral blow up uh, of that tweet uh, this morning. So definitely wishing Mason the best and you know glad uh, glad Christian was able to fulfill that uh, that wish for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, the, the, and as Phil you mentioned, I'm so glad you mentioned Craig Willinger Fund. I I have a lot of great friends as you know um, that are on the board that are very close to the organization and they've done some just amazing things with the cancer community and giving kids these opportunities to fulfill their soccer dreams is just something that you know hits home to me very much and i love that it's a baltimore based Uh organization so i love the shout out i love that you're affiliated with it uh we love their foot golf course in baltimore city that colin and i have played many times and so uh cwfund.org is the address uh, go and donate and help out? You know, fulfilling these these uh, dreams of of kids who are very deserving of it. So, thank you for shouting that out, mm-hmm. and very much respect for the work you do with them. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me on tonight. It was great to talk uh, soccer with you guys, and uh, let's do it again anytime. Let me know, Phil. I'd love to meet you again <laughs> <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> The Footy Travelers podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen My Marks. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.